panels, please make some noise. Daddy John Jules and Chris Barry. chatting about all sorts of things, from bricklaying to uh, I'm a celebrity, get me in here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think Chris Barry is about to go on some dancing competition, isn't it? No, I'm saying? No, 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 no. no never. No. <laughs> yeah. Never. No, uh, I, um, Danny, you had a good experience on that, didn't you? Yeah, that's <laughs> true. Uh, I remember, funny enough, um, when I did uh, Dimension Jump, the, the dwarf convention, when I was doing Strictly, I actually got there and I was wearing sliders. Because my feet were swollen, couldn't get your shoes on. <laughs> and I lost my big toenail. Oh. Yeah. True story. <laughs> you know, like when Debbie Allen sits there at the beginning of fame. She goes, fame casts, and this is where you start paying. <laughs> she weren't joking. <laughs> yeah, no, um, funny enough, there's someone here that's going into Strictly, isn't there? I think it's at Amanda Allington. Yep. Yeah. With my mate Nigel Harmon. That's going to be interesting. <laughs> yeah, I, I just um, I did a play with him, um, the Da Vinci Code, and I was at his fiftieth birthday party in Twickenham, no less. So I say to me and Chris used to come hammering down there, the A three one six going to the Shepherd to the film red door. I regularly pass Chris on a BSA or a Triumph, you know. Goggles, you know, uh, going to work. Living the dream. Living the dream. <laughs> Down the A316. Right? And then someone, while we were rehearsing in uh, Shepparton, switched to the headlight on of my BSA 650. Um, and it, it flattened the battery, flattened battery for the rest of the day. So I was out there kicking, you know, kicking much booty on the, on the old one. BSA. If it didn't start within five kicks, you knew that something was set up a little bit wrong, uh, and you want to preserve your knee. Um, so, oh, not the agent. Um, so, so yeah. So, uh, but yeah, three one six. Happy days. Shepperton uh, G stage. G stage. Yeah, that was uh, that was those were the quite interesting days because they, that was the transition, wasn't it, from the BBC to. Um, uh, Pine. So series four, mm. five, six around there. Which everyone says they enjoyed the most that period. Well, for me, yeah, it was uh, Ace Dimension Jump that yeah. was first appearance of that, which, year, which yeah. I loved. Yeah, trying to make that crocodile look yeah. convincing. That was, um, <laughs> that was age stage. That was that exactly. smaller stage. You know, we, had, we had both stages going up at that time, but. Uh, he was ace on the crocodile. Yeah. <laughs> Take it easy, buddy. Yeah. Great. Uh, <laughs> funny days. Right. Uh, well, did you get a word in there? Yeah, sorry. No, no. <laughs> I'm quite happy to just be in my own and watch you two uh, chat away. This is easy work. Um, I guess, get to the big question first. Uh, Doug and Rob have settled their issues. So does that mean we're going to get some more new Red Dwarf? Ooh, uh, well, um, <laughs> Chris is much. Uh, more eloquent at answering this. <laughs> <laughs> I, I tend to sort of get sued if I answer. <laughs> well, I think I, I've, I've sort of probably said it even in a relatively quiet show, let's that's, that's be honest, um, yesterday and today, probably three or four times, that once, you know, we had the sort of euphoria of hearing that the uh, rights issue was put to bed, then obviously there is going to be a lengthy process of getting the projects out there and getting permissioned. Um, so that's going to take quite a long time. So bearing that in mind, I think, you know, it, it's, I don't think we're going to be shooting anything anytime soon, but you never know. Um, obviously if we do another iteration of Red Dwarf itself in Vision, you know, it'll be a winter shoot because of uh, Robert putting on the, um, uh, put, putting the on giant condom the latex, so but I think everyone, a lot of people seem to be interested in doing live shows at the moment, so that's another little question mark and, and an avenue to be explored. But uh, uh, we had a very good day in Manchester uh, back in 
was the 30th of okay. July. Yeah, July. Craig, Craig and Robbie, Robert came out to play. And uh, so, yeah, there's definitely a lot of excitement and enthusiasm to do more, but uh, we'll just have to see how that uh, transpires. So you're saying there's a chance? Definitely. Yeah. Uh, before that, when was the last time you all got together then, with Craig and Robert, the, the kind of the, the key four principles? Manchester. Before Manchester? Yeah. Six years. Well, that was a Craig term. Together at, oh, at a comic con, but obviously we, we, we would have been the last time we were together would have been special yeah. in January 2020. Wow! Um, what's it like to come to these events all the time and see such a passionate fan base for this thing that you guys uh, well created, carried on the, all the twelve series of specials, the novels, just the Red Dwarf mania, I guess. All these years later. Well, um, and, and that's all answered its own question because 25 years ago the BBC said there was no more audience for Red Dwarf, so they let it go. And so 25 years later they just put on series one and two on repeat on the BBC. So that pretty much answers the question. That's from the, you know, but don't forget that the, 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 during the lack of confidence the BBC had in us. Uh, it just made the confidence in the fans go higher because it's always been that show you know they didn't want to commission it in the first place so uh, you know yeah, by chance we had a very determined producer and, and determined writers who refused to give up and, uh, and you know by luck they met a guy called Peter Estelle Scott you know in Manchester and he had a slot and, and that was it but if someone had said then that uh, 35 years from now <laughs> we'll be here on the, the tour of Comic Cons in uh, not just Britain but, but Europe and America well, right, as well, yeah. um, I just wouldn't, I wouldn't have believed them at all. You know? um, so, and it's fantastic to see so many you know, new you know, young generations coming into, you know, becoming fans of the show. So, yeah, unbelievable really to, to think that uh, it's, it's had the, yeah, it's the legs. It has had, you know. I took a photo outside a, of a bar in Granada in Spain called the Red Dwarf in Ano Rojo. I got the t-shirt, in fact, um, yeah. So, yeah, when you kind of run into stuff like that, you kind of go, oh, God, yeah. And there's a hut in New Zealand in the middle of nowhere called the Red Dwarf Hut. It's painted red. <laughs> called, and it's basically where these mad cyclists go, you know, the, you know, the guys that just ride around. Like, yeah, so there's this little shed called the Red Dwarf, Red Dwarf Hut in the middle of New Zealand, in like the middle of nowhere. But yeah, the those things happen and you know, you should Google it, it's, it is the, it's a real it's a Red Hut in the middle of nowhere in New Zealand called the Red Dwarf Hut. I don't know why it's called the Red Dwarf Hut, but someone out there watches Red Dwarf in the middle of the desert. There's a lot of people that watch the show. <laughs> I don't know. It's true. I mean, the amount of I mean, I've seen from narrow boats called Red Dwarf to number. I mean, how many number plates Red Dwarf I've seen on American number plates is crazy. Yeah. Um, so you know, when, when you see all that stuff, and then someone's saying, "Just no one likes the show anymore, mate." Yeah. You know, you kind of, you know, you have a kind of a, a an interesting twenty-five years, like what we've had. In terms of Google, you mentioned there, is it true? Google tells me you were late for your audition for Red Dwarf. Is that, is that uh, true? It's absolutely true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I didn't know I was late. That helped, <laughs> that helped my character. Because, you know, the very same Peter Risdale Scott who just, you know, saved us from, you know, a life of mediocrity. Um, he was sitting there, you know, head of North, BBC Northwest, Doug Naylor, Rob Grant, Paul Jackson, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and the rest of the, 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 the lackeys that follow these people around all sitting there. And I obviously am half an hour late. So of course I don't know I'm late, so I walk in and barely say hello to anyone. You know, because... But I mean, Dan, you've always been late, haven't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, you, I mean, and everyone now knows that Dan's gonna be late. So then all we're gonna do is just adjust the work schedule ahead of the day. They always yeah. tell me, uh, uh, you know, the time that's, uh, that I'm supposed to be in, they'll give me an, uh, an earlier time. Sure, well, they're, they're the famous story well, of, well, they, they tried to sort of introduce a fining system. A fining system. 
So I said to him, you, you, you may as well, yeah, yeah, you may as well just not give me any money. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just come and work for Green Shield Stamps, you know. So, and the you famous know, story. The famous know. story. Yeah. The famous story is that me and Craig Charles, because we used to, you know, we used to fly to Manchester every weekend, you know, it was madness, you know. Well, um, did you? I went on a bus. Yes. <laughs> we did go on a coach a few times. But, um, so, we, me and Craig missed the plane. But the, the funny thing about it was that um, I wasn't in the, the scenes early, so when we got to the um, when we got to the studio and we got out of the taxi, the producer Paul inverted commas Wacko Jacko Jackson was pacing outside the BBC like this. <laughs> So we're in the cab, and I'm thinking, because we know his reputation, you know, he's quite a, an abrasive chap, and um, uh, I'm like, well, I'm not up next, so I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> I might be late, but I'm not being waited on. Okay. So anyway, he got up about four of the eight steps, and Paul Jackson had him by the lapels and dragged him up the other four. <laughs> Whoop! And that's how he talks to you, like this. <laughs> right, he always, when Paul Jackson talks to that, hey, what's that? What's that? Anyway, so you know, and um, so I'm like in, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I got away with that one. So anyway, another time I came in, right? You know, bouncing in, and there was this lovely sort of. Lady Penelope, the receptionist that was the, the wife of our lighting man, John Pumphrey. Uh, you know, it's, a bit, it's like being greeted by Molly Sugden. Um, and so, so I came in, it's like, am I lying? It was like, there was a big hair situation. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it was the 1980s. Oh, she goes to me, oh, she said, she went, oh, better get in there. She goes, what's the matter? I said, oh, Ed, Ed By is sick, he's not. Directing today, so I said, Who's directing? She went, Paul Jackson. I went, ah, Holy sh. <laughs> so, right, when I got into the studio, because Paul used to wear those big, you know, high flying executive uh, braces, shirt with the red braces or something, you know, power. So, and he's rolling up his sleeves like that. He knew I was going to be coming late. So, he's rolling up his sleeves like that, and he's all oh, great, Dan. Fucking ain't directed for seven years, man, and you come late. What was it? A dead cow in the road? <laughs> That's Paul Jackson, the producer of Red Bull. So now you can understand why this guy ain't gonna give up. He's gonna get this show commissioned. And that's basically what happened. But you'd need that guy. I mean, we can say that it's all very, you know, it was very stressful working with him, but but he's the kind of guy that will get the show that they don't want commissioned, with Rob and Doug pushing him. So when Paul was ready to give up, you know, Rob and Doug would be like, just go one more time, one more time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so those are, you'd need those guys to achieve that. I mean, luckily enough, you can imagine. So from those guys, now they've got the commission, when you roll that down into now, getting hold of the cast and et cetera and et cetera and et cetera. And Danny John Jules is the first person to audition for that part. And he's late. <laughs> so you can imagine. When I finished my, I did, you know, the opening scene. You know, that's the man, this is man. The opening scene, that's what I did at the audition. I did it once through, and then Paul Jackson literally grabbed me by the arm and said, thank you, Danny, and I just got here. And then he went, mate, you're half an hour late. I went, what? <laughs> that, that was basically... And of course, if, if Danny was late, sort of in a, in a season about, you know, 20 times, and I, then I'm late once, they look at me and go, you too! Yeah, <laughs> you're a late cover as well, as well. Because you're one of Danny's gang. You know, exactly, exactly. yeah. You're, you're one of Danny's gang. Um, um, of course. So yeah, it could be, uh, but look, we had to, we were not sure. For 35 years, Paul Jackson gave me my first line on television. You know, um, and that was in a Lenny Henry sketch in Three of a Kind with Tracy Alban and uh, Old Cockfield, did it? Um, 
Yeah. Uh, so it, 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 that's that's what was funny about it. And then when I did that, Ed Bayer was just the floor manager. So it was quite, you know, it, it was really old, you know, to, to be phoned up and said, oh, well, Ed now directing and Paul's producing uh, Red Bull. So that's how I got my audition because I've done a few bits and pieces for Paul before. Well, we will get some questions in the audience. So if you've got any, start big going, put your hands up. We'll get to those in a second. But what's it like for you guys to have, I guess, all the fun, fun interactions you've had when it's kind of generation after generation after generation, I guess, three generations of fans of Red Dwarf. Any particular moments with fans that, that kind of particularly stand out? No, I mean, the, the great thing about these conventions is that you're actually meeting the people who put the show where it is. Without you guys, without the fans, the, the show would be nothing, of course. That's, that's what it's all about, you know, uh, people watching, ratings, numbers, uh, audience appreciation. Yes. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we, uh, you know, I, you know, we can't really, you know, there might have been back in the day, so sort of the old sort of story of fans who were maybe a little bit over keen and would sort of uh, spend yeah. hours in the winter nights sort of outside of, of the Winston Churchill, the Lion Pub in Shepperton yeah. waiting for us. Ed, but Ed, uh, Ed, but uh, yeah, we, no, the fans have been just brilliant, really. It's, it's good, as I say, on this, uh, the Comic Con circuit to, to meet them. Yeah. But also, but that's not just with us, I mean, you, you've got Robin Doug as well, so, you know, what you're getting is immediate feedback about the work, and, you know, so they can then, you know, judge where we go, because they, they, they are hearing what the fans like and don't like, and so you've got, you have that part of it. It's very rare you'd meet a writer of a, of a television show anywhere, you know. Who knows who's right? Who, get, anyone in there know a writer that writes for television right now? See, lucky you. <laughs> <laughs> it's just not some, the kind of person you ever meet. You know, exactly. We, 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 we get the feedback at, at these events. And, yeah, um, well, we're, you know, Rob and Doug have been all over the world to conventions and actually, you know, they were at rehearsal every day. Most people do shows, they never meet the writer. You know, we, met, we had the writers in the room every day, all day. And um, if we were at rehearsals, the two writers were there every day, all day. And they would do rewrites immediately. The gag didn't work. <laughs> Script, take them pages out. They were next door with the laptop, and they rewriting that scene right there and then. And then come in, put the two pages in the script, you know. And then that's when you rehearse that. Let's have a listen. So you know that was going on twenty four seven from Monday morning when we read it round the table. That's the process that goes on. From the first read, it's. Speak now or forever hold your peace. They go right, what about Chris? Let's Chris in the world. Yeah, oh, no. And Craig would go, I haven't got any gags. <laughs> and he said the same thing every week, right? I haven't got any gags. Chris has got all the gags, man. <laughs> but then as the decades went by, we kind of learned that just because Lister would have a laugh line, uh, Cat or River or yeah. Mike might have the feed line. Feed line. Without a good feed line, yeah. the laugh line ain't going to work. And then, so yeah. it's a team. It's a team thing, you know. Well, you that those complaints stop happening when you start getting laughs on the feed line. Yeah, and then you go, oh, hold on a minute, you know, I get it now. Well, that's where the audience again was. Yeah, you know, the studio audience on the night yeah. was one step ahead of us, you know. Yeah, um, and well, that extent, the, the, they would get, they would say, ah, oh, what's, <laughs> what's coming now? Yeah, they know the characters so well. Well, the thing is, the moose, the moose um, gag that was probably one of, you know. One of the biggest laughs of that season was we nearly balled it up because the audience laughed at, at, at the um, at, at the feed line, which was just going on and on and on and on. And I, I was thinking, I hope I remember the last gag, you know, because we <laughs> we were standing there. I'm pointing a, a takeaway at Chris, not not knowing that there was going to be a laugh there. Both of us were staring at each other, going in our mind was going, holy. I didn't know they were going to laugh there. And in, in the later series and the specials, we, we actually had less time to learn the lines than we did in the early shows, because the early shows were done very traditionally. We'd rehearse in like a sort of gymnasium type rehearsal room and, uh, you know, we'd get the lines completely under over three days and it was locked in, in our heads and we'd go up and shoot it. Whereas 
in in Pinewood, it was done very naturally, done very yeah. rehearsed, record. So, yeah. so there's the scripts. Yeah, we're doing that. So too. much more yeah. complicated the way yeah. it, it, it's set up and filmed. It, and well, we did what was a nine-page scene. Yeah, and it was as complicated as hell. The four of us were backstage looking at each other, going, "We don't know this." <laughs> It's true, we were literally pumping ourselves. We've got this huge scene and we're looking at each other. And you know, we just didn't know it. We really didn't know it. The crews are brilliant, but probably because it had been blocked so late, the camera guys and the, the, the sound guys who were essential. Yeah, they've got just as much. They were probably only just on top of it as yeah. well. So, yeah, you know, we were moving from all of us sleeping quarters it through the science nuts. room. And, uh, and I remember going through it and I, it was pretty much nearly word perfect. Yeah. And we got backstage and the four of us looked, looking at each other and go, I don't believe that just happened. I caught Craig's face and his eyes just said, we how, were, how, we how this? did we do how this? How is this? How is this working so well? Yeah, you know. I mean, um, it was it was one of those, we literally went, how the, did that happen? None of us really knew it. I mean, no one would admit to, you know, knowing it because they didn't. And, you know, Craig and Chris are a lot faster learning their line. So if Craig doesn't know his lines, I'm looking, me and Robert are just in terror. Because, <laughs> you know, Craig can learn a page oh, yeah. of, of dialogue over tea break. So if Craig don't know it, you can, you know, me and Robert are in, you know, we were shaking like leaves. Craig is a photographic memory. Photographic right? memory. Yeah. And Craig was crying before that scene, literally. I don't know where, I don't know where. I don't know where. <laughs> How are you going to do it? Yeah, yeah. Robin, yeah. Robin, yeah. Robin, yeah. Robin, 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 and then they'd be doing Red Dwarf and, and realise that, what do you mean, we're not going to shoot the script I had last week? No, we're not going to shoot the script we had yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and I went into, I won't mention any names, I went, I went into makeup one day and the guest uh, the star of the, the, was reading the script, right? And I said to her, very, very you know, not taking me as Oh, I said, I wouldn't, I wouldn't read that. He's going to give you a new one when you get down there. And of course, fear. and of course, <laughs> you know that thing of the addict, it's a joke, isn't it? Well, if you got down there and the first thing you look was, it's got a new rewrite for you. <laughs> 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 yeah, and then that moment of, we're filming in a minute. You know that one? Yeah. Yeah, I did tell you. <laughs> you know that one? Mate, that ended up on auto cue. That one, yeah, yeah, had a meltdown, yeah, yeah. But it's quite—it's it's funny how a lot of them have never done a sitcom. So you know, you've got the audience and you've got the cameras. So they used to play. You know, sitcoms—it's a weird kind of. You got to serve two masters, but you know, obviously, you can't direct it like that. You know, you can't lean towards the camera. It, you know, looks like you're waiting for your shot or something, and you, you know, you can't play out to the audience. But there's a very weird line there that you can do both, yeah, which yeah. We've, we've we've kind of we sussed very early on, and I think that's because a lot of us have done, you know, sketch shows and uh, uh, you know, variety, more variety stuff, which is filmed like that, you know, with audiences and orchestras, and so we were lucky that we did that. I mean, even Craig doing Wogan would have had. The band and five cameras, you know, and, yeah, yeah. Um, mm. and, and Robert. All of us have done those kind of shows. So, but if you haven't done that stuff and you, you've come out of drama school and you're just doing Pride and Prejudice, and then of course you land on Red Dwarf, mate, that's, that's brain damage. <laughs> <laughs> Organised chaos. Okay. Yeah. Uh, right, have you got any questions? Pop your hands up, anybody? Yeah. Any oh, go on. <laughs> um, to both of you, what were your favourite outfits in Red Dwarf and did you get to keep any of them? 
Outfits or outtakes? Outfits. Well, yeah, there's so many. I used to have about four costume changes a show in the early days. So yeah, there was there was so many. I and I and I did, I, I didn't keep any costumes. Funny enough, I, I had about four in five years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So, but the favourite one. Well, I mean, I've always um, been, um, you know, a penchant for the the pink suit. But the simple reason the way it came about in the show, uh, it wasn't, you know, ever meant to be like that. Because, like I said, you're talking, you know, 90s British television, BBC costume design, right? So, you know, you're going to get something pretty much of an emulation of something else, which when I looked at the, <laughs> when I looked at the style for the cat, it was basically the Blues Brothers. You know, with the pork pie hat and the skinny, skin, and I, ooh, ooh. So I just, you know, went to Paul Jackson, the producer of Abrasive Manor, and I just said, straight, Paul, I wore a better suit to the audition than this. And he went, and he, it's a flashback to that day, you know, when I said, he did say, yeah. So the, basically the pink suit, the original pink suit, is an exact copy of the suit I wore to the audition. <laughs> exact, to the, except as I said to Paul, that needs to be the suit I wore, salmon pink. And that's exactly what I've got. Because Paul, is, as, as a patient, he's a professional and he's an, art, he's an artist, he's seen all this before. So, you know, what you got was a decision by Paul that nobody can play with, you know. And, you know, I just told him straight, you know, come on, man, that's what got me the job. I think my uh, favourite costume, or my least favourite costume, was the demonic costume in Demons and Angels. Yeah. <laughs> Where I had lots of pins sticking into me because it was knocked up in yeah, about yeah. 10 minutes and shared the whole studio. It was, it was a lot more disturbing live in the studio than what you saw on the screen, I can assure you. And my favourite was probably the Angels, because... Uh, I can move around in that, I can float. You know, my people love that, that scene. It's come on, someone was just talking on social media about that uh, uh, the other day to me about those demons and angels. Uh, yeah. that, that really... My broke is bad. It weirded, that, it, weirded, it weirded out a lot of people, that scene. It weirded out me. My <laughs> broke has been, what's it? My broke has been babbled. My, my broke, when, when, he, when he dies, it was, yeah. uh, my broke has babbled. Yeah, that, <laughs> again, classic lines. But yes, it, um, but, but for Rimmer, yes, it, it, it obviously is much more straightforward costume situation. Um, I love the fatigues, you know, that ooh, you can buy in an Army Navy shop, you know, in yeah. Series One. Um, the Ace costume, the wig was great, but the costume itself was a bit sort of floaty and a bit sort of clingy, so uh, that wasn't as good as it kind of looked. Um, but yeah, I think one of the either the green or the red. That you know were made for suit. It was fine. They're all. Uh, it's, it's a completely different, you know, phenomenon for me to talk about a costume compared to, to Dan. <laughs> well, the you know, the, the old classic. You know, to, for me, to see River and Lister, you know, in their um, in their baggy red suits with the ruffles and the white Cuban heel boots, you know, struggling. <laughs> Corns during tongue tide was my one of my biggest pleasures. <laughs> There's nothing about tongue tide that was good. <laughs> Those guys, I mean, oh, great. it was it absolutely hysterical from my point of view. You know, uh, so uh, this is this is the kind of you know uh, an impersonation of Chris and 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 Craig coming out from the dressing room, hitting the studio floor to do this show. So of course you imagine it. Craig's livid, isn't he? <laughs> fucking dancer. Only <laughs> fucking <laughs> Yeah, all right, it won't be that long, you know. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't get too upset, Craig. I'm a fucking daddy. That was basically their plan. So, of course, for me, it was just, you know, glory. You know. Because I, I, you know, well, you know, Danny's sort of, you know, living this literally a dream, you know, living um, the dream. and then, and then you had, you know, um, 
the, the proper real professional dancers behind them. I mean, nice. laughing at Craig in the, in the front there, <laughs> sort of sitting there counting these pathetic steps that we're trying to do. And then, was it Charles Orgy? Charles Orgy bellowing at them. Just uh, saying, Danny, that's real good, that's real good. Girls? Girls. Yeah. Okay, keep it up, you're going to that's good. Keep the pace, uh, Chris Craig. Chris Craig, yeah. No, we'll just keep going, just keep trying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And then you had Ed Bai coming in. Can I have them, please? We've got a show to rehearse. It was <laughs> lunacy. It was absolute lunacy. <laughs> of course, you know, Ed running around, like up and down those stairs, you know, it's, you've got to remember, this is like doing Saturday Night Variety Show. It was a set and dancers and, uh, you know, cameras everywhere. And he was saying, this is three minutes. It's three this is minutes. no more than three minutes of the show. We've got 24 <laughs> other minutes yeah. of comedy yeah. to yeah. do, you know? Um, it was, it was. Well, because nobody spent that kind of time on sitcoms, to, you know, on a dance. We, we spent all day filming that. So, yeah, yeah I think Craig and I will probably get the blame for, you know, exactly. um, <laughs> if Craig and Chris can come to But <laughs> what happens? We're still 35 years later, people are talking about that number. And, you know, especially everyone saying how they love seeing Craig and Chris in those costumes. Yeah. <laughs> Counting. <laughs> I think that is the absolute perfect way to end things. Please, let's give it a round of applause for Barry Duncan Hills. Thank you, guys. There we go. Fantastic. If anyone wants to start.